Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and welcome to episode 117 of the Monday Night Review. I hope you are all well. For those of you in the south of England, are you enjoying the weird extra summer we're having? I mucked out horses in my shorts yesterday, which seems very odd for the 8th of October. I'm doing today's relatively unscripted. I've got notes. I hope that we don't miss out vital information. But I'm trying to squeeze this in while my husband is taking my kids to their swimming lessons so that I get this up on time. I will never again say that now the kids are back at school, we're getting back to regular programming because that really put a spanner in the works, didn't it? Had a, the worst anxiety attack I've ever experienced. It took me a week to get over. It was pretty horrendous. And also we're going to North Wales today and we have discussed before my appalling pronunciation of anything in Wales or Welsh words. So brace yourselves, buckle up. We're going to talk about the disappearance of Trevelyne Evans today, which I don't have. I quite, when I do a, an unsolved story, I quite often have something that I think happened. For example, um, Sophie Toussaint de Plantier I quite clearly had my husband was uh, only criticism of that episode was I did not uh, mention the terrible poetry enough um, for my main suspect and the poetry really is unfathomably awful there is something about a white middle class Englishman and terrible poetry that really is unacceptable. And and as an English woman, I apologise to the rest of the world. His poetry is terrible, but I am cautiously not naming him now. I don't want to. He I, he's sued enough people. I don't want me to be the next one. But today, I'm stumped. I'm stumped. And so I look forward to your feedback on what you think. We're going back to 1990 and I watched uh, some Crime Watch episodes about this and God love the 90s. Oh, I could, there's something infinitely, I know there shouldn't be anything soothing about Crime Watch, but my goodness, uh, it was soothing. I could have watched hours of it, but I didn't. On the, the evening of Saturday, June 16th, 1990, Richard Evans calls his home in Llangollen. His wife should be there. She had left him three days earlier at their holiday cottage, holiday cottage, holiday bungalow that they had just bought in Rhythlin. And had taken their car, they only had one car, she'd driven the car back down to to Llangollen to open up her shop. And he doesn't get an answer. He's not particularly fussed. Uh, His wife, Trevelyne, is very sociable. She grew up in the area in which they live. She's got lots of friends. So he calls back a little while later. Still no answer. He calls back several times and she's not there. Obviously, pre-mobile phones. And concerned, he phones neighbours and friends to see if they know where she was and is probably comforted by the fact that a few of them have definitely seen her that day. And, you know, he's slightly concerned in case something's happened to her. She's not elderly, she's 52. But obviously, if if you're not hearing from a loved one, there is always that concern that maybe they've fallen down, they've, they've broken something, they've knocked themselves out. And he speaks to a neighbour who lives in the middle of town and asks them to go and check her shop. Trevelyne Evans's shop is Attic Antiques and she'd bought it in 1989. Antiques and bric-a-brac were her lifelong passion. She had lovely antiques. She also had boxes of bric-a-brac that she would put outside every day. And um, she just loved it and I think part of what she loved about the shop was chatting to people she'd happily chat to anyone she'd buy antiques from anyone and 
And most of her customers were her friends. You can imagine if your friend has has an antique and bric-a-brac shop and that is your jam. Then you're constantly going to be going in there. For example, this summer I became fixated on the fact that I didn't have a small vase for, I don't know if anyone else's children pluck sad flowers and then hand them to them at the end of the walk. But I needed a receptacle for these sad bits of lavender and buttercup that I am constantly being handed. And I sort of got fixated on it. And I just think the first place I'd go and the first place I did go was thrift shops, charity shops. So I can imagine if I had a friend who had one of these shops, I'd be in there quite a lot. And her friends were in there quite a lot. So this neighbour walks along to check out Attic Antiques and they find that the Evans's car is still parked outside and what's very concerning was the bric-a-brac boxes that she put out every day were still outside which showed that the shop had not been closed up properly. The door was locked and there's a sign on the door that says back in two minutes. So because he's now concerned, she's obviously been gone from the shop longer than two minutes and the shop has not been closed up properly. She hasn't gone anywhere in the car because the car is still there and nobody seems to have seen her recently. Richard calls the police. Now, Trevelyne's got two brothers. She's got a brother called Len Davis and then another brother called Philip. Philip lives abroad, but he is over visiting and Philip calls Len to say that Trevelyne is missing and they go to the shop to double check for themselves. They also tell their father and her father takes the news very badly. He's very distressed. And after... 24 hours, the the family is completely distraught and, and notify the police that she's still not uh, d- turned up. So the house is on Castle Street, I believe, and the Evanses live a, a short walk away in Market Street, and they've been married for 30 years. As I say, they just purchased this holiday bungalow in Rithlin, which was their sort of planning place that they plan to retire to there are lots of rumors around their marriage which I'm going to go into in a bit but at the time everything was reported as very contented she's very happy we know that she loved her shop she just bought it and she had lots of friends she's very sociable and so the police now start investigating this as a missing persons case. And obviously the first thing they do is they want to find out who last saw travelling, what she was doing, what is the last time that anyone has seen her. So this is the 16th of June. Uh, we should talk about Langochlin which is 10 miles west of Wrexham. It's on the edge of the River Dee, which is a very fast flowing river. There's also a canal, which will be of interest later on. And it's very, very beautiful, very beautiful North Wales. There's campsites, bric-a-brac shops, tea shops, cafes, and it's very popular with tourists, especially in the summer. This is the 16th of June. I've heard one person say it's deep in the summer holidays. It's not deep in the summer holidays. In fact, for a lot of schools, it wouldn't have been summer holiday time yet. But we know that this was a busy, sunny Saturday and there were were lots of people around. You know, summer summer has started in terms of the tourist industry, but it was a close-knit community. Locals looked out for each other. Everyone knew each other. And as I said earlier, Trevelina lived in the area all her life. So she really had a strong social base here. So we know that the the second week of June in 1990, she and Richard go to their bungalow, which they are renovating. And Richard is doing this work himself. She's working on the garden. And he said, you know, she's very happy. Would he say anything else? Probably not. Then on the morning of the 16th of June, she, she, she comes back a few days before this. Uh, she comes back around the 13th or 14th 
as I say, with their only car. And the police are able to to trace her movements on the morning that she disappears. So on the 16th, she opens the shop at around 9.30 in the morning. And it's believed that over the course of that morning, 25 friends and customers come in and out of the shop. She goes to the corner shop. I call it a corner shop. I guess a corner shop, in my mind, it doesn't have to be on a corner. It's, it's you know, your local shop, she, which is, on the, I believe, on the same row as Attic Antiques. Attic Antiques is not there anymore. It's been turned into a house. But she goes there. She buys some milk. She obviously knows the owner of the shop. The owner of the shop knows her. and. They make an exchange, something along the lines of uh, Trevelyan saying, I can have my morning cup of coffee now because she's got her milk. Now, the shopkeeper would later say to the police that when Trevelyan paid, the shopkeeper noticed that she had a wadge of money. She called it, she said a wad of money on her. Uh, so a lot of banknotes and she sees this because she holds it out of her purse to get change for the milk out of the bottom and the shopkeeper said she almost wanted to say oh you should be careful waving that money around but didn't really feel it was her place obviously classic woman classic 90s but was quite surprised to see that that wadge of cash so traveling then goes back to her the shop Next up is Christine Burdett, who is a very good friend of Trevelyne's, and she drops in to have some coffee. She takes a posy of flowers that would be found in the shop later, and they sit and have a chat. They are both planning on going to a party later, and Christine would say that Trevelyne was really looking forward to it. She was happy, chatty, and, you know, they have a very normal discussion there there wasn't anything worrying Trevelyne that they didn't talk about anything else and then about 12 40 ish she closes up the shop and she leaves a sign on the door saying back in two minutes and interestingly people say that she would be specific it wasn't just you know how some people say back in 10 minutes and then bugger off for three hours to the pub she would be quite specific so she said back in two minutes on the sign and as it was a busy Saturday, she really wasn't in the habit of leaving the shop for very long at all, if at all, because obviously it's a great day for customers. We know that at about 1 p.m., she buys an apple and a banana at the market. It's noted that she's a big fan of bananas. And then someone sees her walking the route towards her house. Whether she was going back to her house or not is up for debate. People see her in the area of her house. No one sees her entering or leaving. Now, when her brothers eventually get into the shop on the 17th, the day after she's gone missing, they find her powder compact open on the table as if she'd just used it. They find her handbag with her wallet in there with her cards and nothing, you know, it's literally like she has just stepped out for two minutes. So there's some speculation about whether she came back to the shop because her wallet was there and we know that she bought the apple and banana, but I think possibly she just took some change with her rather than taking her whole bag. And her keys are in the bag. So again, did she go home and then come back to the shop afterwards, forget to take the sign off the door, and then something happened? But I think she possibly wouldn't. I feel like she this was her passion. She was quite conscientious. I don't know that she would necessarily have forgotten to take the sign off the door. Also. I think she had the door open when she was in the shop rather than so so I think they're sort of 
it, it, to me, it just doesn't sit right that she went out and then came back and then went out again. So if her keys are in her bag, you know, and these are not, as far as I know, these are not absolutely 100%. It's a woman fitting her description was seen. So the the the, the sightings of Treveline over the afternoon are very strange. We've got her bag and her makeup compact in the shop and there's a banana peel in the shop bin, but she's fond of bananas. That could easily have been a banana that she had as a mid-morning snack. That does not mean it's the banana that she just bought. During the Saturday afternoon, people bought items from the boxes outside the shop and posted money through the letterbox. So we know that for a fair amount of the afternoon, she's just not there. Money has been posted through. So I think it's a fair assumption to say that once she left at 12.40, she did not return. At 2.30, one witness says they saw her in Market Street near her house. So that's nearly two hours after she was supposed to have left her shop. No one sees her leave or enter her house. Not long after, another witness says that a woman matching her description is walking along the A5 next to a park beside the River Dee. And this is on the other side of town. This is a, it would, I, I believe they say they saw her at about 2.40. And this is not a 10 minute walk. She'd have had to have been given a lift if, if, both of these sightings are Treveline, which I do not believe. Then she would have had to have been given a lift. And there's no reason, as far as we know, that she would be there. Um, and I think that there's this a lot of emphasis on the fact that Treveline would buy antiques. She had a sign in the shop that said, I will buy anything. She, you know, so some people say, was she going out to meet someone? I think if you're going out to meet someone, you take your wallet, you take your bag. So we have that. We then have just before six, a woman is driving up Church Street, which is where her shop is, not Castle Street, as I said earlier. Sorry, it's Church Street. And she sees a man who she believes is looking suspicious standing outside Attic Antiques. And she thinks, but she's not sure, that the door to the shop is open. But when the family come to check later that day, and when the neighbour goes around to check later that day, the, the door is shut and bolted. So, again, we're not sure about this. Now, there are a lot of reports of... Trevelyn speaking to different men over the course of the couple of days that she was there before her disappearance, on the day of her disappearance. And then we also have this suspicious looking man standing outside. I have this thing about suspicious looking men because I think once you know something has happened, lots of men look suspicious. Um, obviously the police at the time asked for the men matching these descriptions to come forward because obviously then they can rule them out. So they're like, if you were here at this time, please come forward and then we can rule you out. I don't believe the suspicious looking man was ruled out. She was seen talking to two men on the morning of the 16th, but outside the shop by a car. And again, uh, I don't think this is suspicious. I think this could quite easily be someone buying something or selling something to her. I think she's very personable. I think that's part of the appeal of her shop is that meeting people, chatting to people and that kind of thing. One person that came up a lot was a smart man. I'm doing that in bunny ears because that's what he's referred to as. He's described as wearing a blue suit and carrying a black suitcase. And one lady who worked at a butcher's, again, I believe on Church Street, said on the morning of the 16th, she saw Trevelyan walking along with this man, blue suit, black suitcase, light brown hair turning grey, and she waves at Trevelyan and said she noticed how pretty she was looking that day. 
so there's a lot of emphasis on this this man. I believe she's seen having a drink with him in a wine bar at some point. But interestingly, this many years later, in fact, I can't work out if this there's a very not great uh TV show called something like in the footsteps of criminals or something similar. Um with Amelia Fox that covered this and I, it's it's not great I don't think it's not it's I, I don't recommend it as a tv show but I believe it it could be in in this in 2021 in their show that this woman comes forward and she identifies the the smart man the man in the in the blue suit and she identifies the man in the blue suit to be Trevelyan's brother Phil. Now Phil lived abroad. He was over visiting, and there was a photo fit done of this man and this lady, who I believe is called Lynn, looked at the photo fit and said, "That's her brother. Her brother who's over visiting." And Lynn is sure of this because she dated Phil, and she met Phil two days after Trevelyne's disappearance. Now, Lynn was a barmaid and Phil came in and they started chatting and she said, you know, he needed someone to unburden himself to and we just hit it off and we were chatting. And I know that that man in the photo fit is Phil. And of course she was seen with him. He always dressed very smart. He, uh, of course she was seen with him. He was visiting, so they saw each other as much as possible. But she also flagged a few things. Now, throughout this investigation, it was said that they had a very happy marriage. She was very contented. And Lynn, I think she dated Phil for a couple of years. And she said it wasn't a happy marriage. She was told by Phil that the marriage was not happy. And she also said that Richard Evans, the husband, was not well liked. Trevelyan is very well liked. Richard was not well liked in town and he would often come into the bar and talk to her. And she said he never once seemed upset. He never once said, oh, I miss her or I just want to know where she is. She said that she found that very unusual. And obviously everyone reacts to things differently, but that is just worth noting that he never seemed upset. She also said that he got rid of furniture and carpets from their house and she thought at the time, gosh, if Trevelyne comes back and you've got rid of all that stuff, she's not going to be happy. So that implies that he was doing this fairly soon after she disappears with the implication that she, he knows she's not coming back. It's more you almost hear more the other way around where people don't want to change things. They don't want to move in case that person comes back. Whereas Richard w w was the opposite. Now, there's also rumours that she was having extramarital affairs. I can't find a lot of information to back this up. Rumours started circulating after her disappearance. And as we know with women quite often their reputation gets sullied when they're not there to defend themselves or even when they are. But one of the rumours was that one of her men friends had died leaving her £10,000. And for some people, this would account for the wedge of money that she was carrying around. Though I don't believe she was carrying around ten grand, But it could be that that was money she was taking to the shop for the day or that was money that she was going to take to the bank to cash in. Now, this money was not found. Notably, I don't believe that the cash, the wadge of cash that she was carrying around was found. I would say there's quite a big difference between being in a happy and contented marriage and actually being uh, unhappy having extramarital affairs and having a husband who doesn't seem to particularly show emotion about the disappearance, is happy to move furniture. 
And there's also some speculation that she was not happy with the idea of retiring to Rithlin and that she did, you know, that was all Richard's idea and what Richard wanted to do. And she was very happy where she was. So whether this all kind of got made to imply that perhaps she'd had enough and had left of her own accord. What could have happened to Trevelyn Evans? Well, let's see. Did she leave of her own accord? Was she in an unhappy marriage? And she just thought, enough's enough. I want to start afresh. Well, she didn't take anything with her. She just took the clothes she was standing up in. She didn't take her wallet, her bag, her makeup. Uh, None of her bank accounts. There was no activity on her bank accounts. It wasn't like she took one card and that was it. She didn't take her passport. And her brother was very firm about the fact that they had lost their mother when Trevelyn was 11. And he said she knew what it was to lose a mother and to lose a family member. She would never do that to anyone. Now, Richard and Trevelyn have a son who was obviously very distressed. He had two children who Trevelyn was absolutely doting on. And so Len, the brother, says, you know, there's no way that she would just up and leave them and leave a hole and not tell her son. I also obviously don't know Trevelyn, but I feel like she had a strong community behind her and a community that was not necessarily a fan of her husband. I think if she said enough's enough, I, I don't want to go to Ritalin, I don't want to be married to you anymore. She would have friend support. She was in the area that she'd grown up in. I don't think that necessarily she there would have been people who were anti this decision. There was obviously, even in the 90s, there were people who would be disapproving. But I feel like she didn't have a connection, a, a strong connection away from North Wales to go to. So I, I, I think that's worth noting. I mean, there have, of course, been loads of reports of sightings of her there. She's been reported as being seen in Australia, in London. A report from France of a sighting brought Interpol into everything. But every sighting has come up as a dead end. And as I said, she didn't take her passport. Now, travelling without a passport in the 90s is probably a lot easier, but it's not you know, no passport, no money. So what we're essentially saying is she had someone to help her run away who was going to fund everything and who's going to buy her new clothes, new passport. She was never going to touch her money again. She was going to leave her beloved son and grandchildren, the shop she just bought that she loved. It just does not in any way fit with her personality and also I don't know but I believe that if you were chatting to your best friend on the morning before you disappear out of everyone's lives forever you wouldn't come across as normal and cheery and looking forward to the party that you're both attending later I feel like maybe they would know that something was not right they There's been a lot of criticism of the police handling of this because if we're talking about something on a a true crime podcast, often the police have mishandled it. That's how it isn't just done, dusted and solved. Uh, The police did search the River Dee and they did search the canal. So that's two things that are worth noting. So it's unlikely that Trevelyn Evans just left of her own accord so another option is that she was out somewhere and she suffered an injury or some medical emergency she could have had a stroke which would have left her disorientated but she does her body isn't found anywhere they search the river no body they search the canal no body yes wales can be very rural but she would have to walk a very long way 
disorientated and then find somewhere incredibly remote that is later searched by dogs and not found. It seems incredibly unlikely that this has happened. One thought that I had that then I know lots of other people have had uh, was, was she a victim of a hit and run? Someone hit her, didn't want to admit to what they'd done, so dispose of her body in some way. It could have happened, but there's no evidence of, of an accident. There's no skid marks found. There's no... It, it seems unlikely. As we know, most hit and runs do exactly that. They hit the person, off they go. You're sort of embroiling yourself more in a situation by picking the person up and putting them in your car. Uh, so the police have ruled that out. As with a lot of cases, there have been psychics that have come forward. Uh, one psychic came forward to the police and said, There's, you're never going to find her body. There's no body to be found. This psychic thinks they're right because, of course, they haven't found a body. There's another psychic who was on a canal bank near Langochlin and had this overwhelming feeling that Trevelyne's body was nearby. The police got got out there, searched with sniffer dogs. Nothing was found. All psychic things, as far as I know, have been followed up by the police. The police now, because of the attention that this has garnered, have pulled their fingers out slightly and have have made attempts you know they have checked out if a psychic comes forward and says i think she's here they do go and check but but they've led to nothing in 1997 she's officially declared dead and in 1999 the son of richard and treveline evans who himself has become a local police sergeant, dies suddenly of a heart attack. He had had a third child while Trevelyne had been missing and maintained to the end, you know, she would never have cut herself off from her family. She would never have denied her family that, having lost her own mother early on. In 2001, the, the case was reopened and upgraded to a murder investigation with the focus being on the three days before her disappearance they had 10 officers in an incident room going over all the evidence they had and in April they withdrew the artist's impression as not being accurate but mm, I think perhaps someone else said you know that's actually her brother it is also, you know, they reopen it as a murder inquiry. In the 1990 Crime Watch, they, they say at the time, this is a murder inquiry. They, made, they, they quit pretty quickly decided that she had been uh, um, some, some form of foul play had happened, despite uh, witnesses saying that they see her you know in 1992 in Australia and all of that no one as I say believes she went voluntarily the police don't believe she was the victim of a hit and run there are a few serial killers who have been looked at in terms of this case neither of which work for me but should be covered as the police looked into it themselves the first is Robin Ligus, who killed three people between April and October 1994 near Shrewsbury, which is just across the border from Wales. Anyone say just across the border from Wales? Wales is big. Wales has um, quite scary, long, middle-of-nowhere roads. But to be fair, it, it, he is, a, it turns out, about 13 miles away from Langotlin. And... He's considered just partly because obviously he's a serial killer and he uh, is is near. He's in the vicinity. However, he has murdered three people, all men, and all in the 
process of burgling them for money, which he used for drugs. So we've got a man who who robs houses, kills the occupants, gets the money, uses it for drugs. Trevelyne's may have had that wadge of cash on her for sure, but he's taking a risk if he's deviating from what he usually does. He's not going into the house. He's burgling her on the off... He's he's robbing her on the off chance that she's going to have money on her. Or he's seen this wadge of cash that she's carrying around. But as far as I know, he's never made any attempt to really hide the body. Uh, It just, to me, is, is too far away from his other crimes. I think he's much more likely to break into uh to break into to the antique shop and maybe kill her but and, and then you know take what he needed but I don't think he just sort of hangs about and waits for people who may have money the other person who is worth considering is Christopher Halliwell now he is convicted of two murders in 2012. He has, has murdered two women in the Swindon area and buried them in fields. Now, one of these women is found, and then whilst he's there with the police officer, he says, do you want me to show you where I've buried another one? And he takes them to where another woman is buried. Now, this is a very complex case with policemen getting fired and all of that. And I may do it as a separate episode because it's quite interesting. But he hints that he's responsible for eight murders. He, When they search his stuff, they find that he's got over 60 items of clothing belonging to women. He has sketches of several areas of outstanding natural beauty which people wonder if this is uh, uh, their drawings of where bodies are buried and there's a lot of very tenuous links so for example he is a glass fitter in north wales so he could be in the area could know the area he could have sized up at Trevelyn Evans. There's also a lot of story about how he hated women, how he really hated his mother. So the two women that Halliwell murders, that he's convicted of murdering are in their early 20s, and Trevelyn's 52. So f- that's a very different age range. He's also thought to be involved in numerous other murder cases all of whom are young women who have disappeared he was a taxi driver so have disappeared on their way home from nights out we know that traveling didn't disappear on the way home from a night out but it's thought that possibly his hatred of his mother and traveling apparently resembling his mother he could have seen her and just seen red literally and we know that he's quite good at concealing the bodies he shows the police the burial place of one of the women that he's murdered and it is in a field near a wall where a tractor would never go near and you know the police like if if he hadn't shown us There's just no way she would ever have been found. So we know that he's he's thoughtful about where he buries his victims. And that would explain why she just vanished into thin air. He's also a big fan of canals and travelling along canals. And one canal near where he lives ends at Langothlin. Which, you know, would fit 
But also there are a couple of witnesses who see a man in a van on the day that she disappears who resembles Christopher Halliwell. Now, when this man is shown a picture of Christopher Halliwell, he says that is very similar to him. He doesn't give 100% confirmation, which is very sensible. So he was a, a strange man was seen in the area, a strange man in a van was seen in the area, but again... Was it just a man in the van in the area that now seems strange? He, Christopher Halliwell's known to steal antiques and to steal, uh, to, to steal from antiques. One theory is that whoever was responsible for her disappearance sort of knew that she would buy anything or be interested in any antiques. So just said, you know, I've got some stuff in the back of my van. Do you want to come and have a look and see if any of it's for you? Very easy to get her there and then you know, sticker in the back of the van. Obviously, with any disappearance, any murder case, the first suspect is the husband or boyfriend or partner. And the husband is arrested. I cannot remember what date he's arrested because as I said, I'm doing this from notes. He is arrested. He's arrested when he's 72. He's arrested. He's, quote, helping police with their inquiries. Um, but he has a cast iron alibi. I saw one thing that said that he was seen in the area on the morning of the 16th. But he has numerous witnesses that can put him at their holiday bungalow or in that area on the day that she disappeared. We also know that she has their only car. Their only car was found outside her shop. So he would have had to have an accomplice. He would have had to have someone to help him get from the holiday bungalow to Glanglochlin to uh, whether they knew what his plan was or not. And if they didn't know what his plan was, the hopes is that they would come forward. If they did know what his plan was, there's no one that they can link him to. It's someone that he has no link to who did this for him and then has not caused any suspicion since. And I just can't reconcile that he had anything to do with it. Was he a pleasant man? It doesn't sound like he was. Was their marriage perfect? It doesn't sound like it was. But unless we can work out how he's got these alibis that have been checked out by the police and how he got there and cleverly disposed of his wife in a way that she wasn't found and he wasn't seen. He, you know, it one person I think said they saw him in the area. But they're well known in the area. More people. We know that 25 people at least went into her shop that morning. So then for him to be able to go around the town without his wife noticing seems very unusual. And I do believe that the police would have chased this. Could he have bought a car, driven down? surprise his wife by saying woohoo look it's me I'm in this new car yeah he could but I'm assuming the police have ruled that out so what's incredibly frustrating about this case is she you know the the person who you would think it was has definitely been ruled out by police now what's very weird was that two brothers come forward in May 2019, they go to the press and they say that they've just lodged a formal complaint against the North Wales Police for mishandling. Um, they're, they're called Andy Sutton from Wrexham and his brother Lee and they've gone forward to the police and given them some information and they believe that the police have mishandled this and they file a complaint. Now, they say that they were given information in February of that year relating to the disappearance and murder of Treveline, and this information pointed to the remains, her remains, being buried under the floorboards at the Ridling Golf Club bar. Now, 
from the get-go, this seems weird to me. If I'm trying to dispose of a body and I have the whole of North Wales, I, I cannot explain. If you haven't been to North Wales, Google it, have a look. I'll put pictures up. There's a lot of rural places that you can dispose of a body. Why put it under the floorboards in a bar? It is going to absolutely honk. And people, a golf club bar is always going to have people in it. So for me, this is just a no. Anyway, the two brothers get permission to look under the floor with cameras. They don't seem to pull up the floorboards directly and they pass their findings over to the police. The police then carry out their own search, including a dig on the golf course grounds, and say that the search was, quote, unsuccessful. The brothers don't accept this. And the implication is that they found something under the floorboards that had then been moved by the time the police searched. Now, if I was looking under the floorboards for a body and I found evidence of a body I would immediately from the bar call the police I wouldn't hand wouldn't go away and do you, it seems bizarre to me that you wouldn't immediately phone the police and say I've just found a body under the floorboards here anyway the complaint gets handed over to the watchdog who's in charge of police complaints And they have an investigation taken over by the local police force. But nothing comes of this. But what's really bizarre is in 2021, 2021, a message is written on a plaque on a bench 30 miles from her hometown, accusing someone of removing the remains in Ridlin. The plaque reads... In memory of Trevelyne Evans, vanished 16-6-1990, found Ridley Golf Club, 14-3-2019, removed 19-3-2019, RIP. A similar message was discovered in May 2022 on a bench at an abandoned 200-year-old miner's cottage on a hillside in Press Satin. The inscription read... Justice awaits those responsible for the removal and disposal of Trevelyne Evans in this life or next from Ridland Golf Club on March the 19th, 2019 at noon. May the Lord have mercy upon their soul. Now, the two brothers absolutely deny that they had anything to do with these plaques. But my thing is, 2019 is not the same as 1990. 2019, you've got. CCTV. You've got till receipts. How is a body moved from a golf club at noon, allegedly, in March with no witnesses? And why are these plaques being left i don't understand i can understand people not liking the police i can understand people thinking that the police have a bungled things but if you know enough to say that she was moved at noon on the 40 on the 19th of march go to the police you don't have to go in person You can put all the information you have in an envelope and put it through the door. You can put all the information you have, you know, give it to someone else to deliver to the police. It just seems very strange to me to have information and not come forward after all this time. Christopher Halliwell also, I think, is still around. I wonder how much investigation to link him has gone on. We know that there were 60 items of clothes belonging to the women. We know that they weren't in great condition by the time they're found. So I don't know. Again, I haven't gone, I'd have gone off onto a huge tangent if I'd 
looked into this too much, but I know that the, the items of clothing, his mementos from his victims were not in a great condition, but were any linked to Treveline? Could any be linked to Treveline? Um, you know, has he been asked outright? He obviously took them to the second burial site. Has he been asked outright? Has I, I want to know how much cross-referencing there has been between them. And I say I, I don't believe that she went off to start a new life. I don't think she had itchy feet. I don't think she had uh, a, a connection to somewhere else in the world enough to take her away from her son and his children. I think she loved her shop. I think she had great friends. I think she loved her social life. For me, there's nothing to indicate that she left of her own true, you know, volition. But it also seems strange to have someone taken in the middle of a day by a serial killer. Because it's just sort of not how they operate. She wouldn't have gotten, you know, a, a lot of his victims, I believe, got into Christopher Halliwell's taxi. She w wouldn't have got it, needed a taxi. She had her car. Did he have a van and, she, and, and knew that she was into antiques? But again, was he stalking her? Did he stake her out? Did he know? It just seems to me incredibly weird for her, for, for someone of her type, uh, you know, age, locality, all of that to be picked at random uh, and the body never found. But who knew her who would want to get rid of her apart from her husband who has been cleared and who is now dead? But the only living person, I believe, is her brother Len who's left in her family and her father died heartbroken her brother and son died not knowing what happened to her I don't know what her husband was like but he obviously died not knowing what happened to her he dies in 2009 so he dies in 2009 so he is taken in to the police earlier so not long before he dies he's he's held by the police and questioned and cleared so what happened to Trevelyn Evans? It's a complete mystery. I'd love to know your thoughts. I'd love to know if you've read up about this case, if you've any ideas, if I've missed anything. It, I, I think it's almost too neat to tie it up with someone like Christopher Halliwell. I don't know that he'd nip over to North Wales and pick up his, his, you know pick up a woman that didn't sort of fit his his type unless it was that she just looked enough like his mother to to send him off into a rage it, the whole thing is mind boggling and i don't think we're going to find out what happened to her the terrible things about the the moors murders and the the child who hasn't been discovered Keith Bennett who hasn't been found it's just there's so much of the Yorkshire Moors and it's the same with North Wales there's just so much uh, countryside there that even if that's where she's been buried you know it's now been since since 1990 we're looking for skeletal remains that could easily have been spread by animals or you know there's just a lot of ground to cover with no clue of where to go i'd love to hear from you so do email me the monday night review at gmail.com you can find me on social media at the monday night review we're on tiktok instagram facebook you can come over and join the patreon you get free episode free you get an extra episode every week unless there's a crisis happening in my life. 
There's lots of articles on there written by the wonderful Holly. And you can buy merch. There'll be a link below. You can check out my reading recommendations also in the link below. You can buy me a coffee in the link below. Your support is really welcome. And until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive. <laughs>